Welcome to the Dough Roller Money Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Berger. Today in episode 318, we're going to talk about the documents and stuff you should keep as it relates to your home. Uh, some of it has tax implications, some of it's just stuff you may need later on. And I'm going to walk through how I save it. I think it's a reasonable approach, and hopefully it'll help you. And actually, it's a, an approach we can apply to other things, like organizing your tax documents or saving information about your cars. And uh, how this came up, my wife and I have been debating for a year, should we do some things to our current home? We've lived here 15 years. Or should we move? And we had set June 1, I'm recording this in July of, what year is it? 2019. Uh, we set June 1 as sort of our deadline. If we couldn't find a home we, we both were excited about and wanted to move to, we would just stay put and renovate. And it was going to be a not insignificant amount of work. And so I think in many ways, we both preferred moving. If we you know, move into a house that really didn't need much, if any, work, you know, the move is a pain, but then it's done. And, uh, but we, we couldn't find anything. And we'd spent literally it was a year looking. And on about May 20th, I think, uh, we saw a home listed. It's just 10, 15 minutes from where we live now in Northern Virginia. Went and looked at it. Long story short, we bought the thing. We've sold our home. We don't move until August. But as part of this process, you know, the realtor's asking me for all this documentation about our current home. Do you have a survey, a plat? Do you have this? Do you have that? And I'm pretty good at keeping all of that stuff. And more or less, it's organized. And I did find it. But it wasn't always, it wasn't always easy. And I thought, you know, for this new home, I'm going to do things a little differently. And just as an example, one of the issues that came up as we got our home ready for sale was a lot of the rooms needed touch-up paint. So you've probably been there. It's like, okay, wait a minute. Do we have any of this paint anywhere? Let's go look at the paint cans. Of course, the labels on them have faded. You can't read them. Uh, some rooms we didn't have. We didn't know what paint. We didn't even know what paint brand was used in, in the room or even when it was painted. We couldn't remember, you know. And that was kind of frustrating. And then we had a, a problem with uh, a floor that we had to fix. And, you know, do we have information on when the floor was installed and what materials were used. And that was kind of an issue. Fortunately, we had some information on that, but it really sort of motivated me for the new home to kind of get things you know, better organized. And I originally thought, you know what I'll do is I'll set up a WordPress blog. I'll password protect it. This wouldn't be something publicly available, but just for my wife and I. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of create blog entries for everything. And my wife She's usually the more level-headed one between the two of us. She said, yeah, Rob, that's not really a good idea. And she was right, of course. Honey, if you're listening, you were right. And uh, so I came up with a much simpler approach, and she likes it, very important, and I think it works. So I'm going to share it with you today, both how I'm going to save the stuff as it relates to our new home, and what that stuff is, and why I'm saving it, and why I think it's important. So if you're watching this via video, you should see a, a Word or a, a Google Doc uh, that I will share in the Facebook group. Just go to doughroller.net slash Facebook group. Uh, it'll redirect you to the Facebook group you can join. And I will drop this uh, in the Facebook group and you guys can... It's a, I've set it up sort of as a generic file at this point. I haven't added any of our personal information. So you'll be able to use it. Uh, however you'd like. And um, so here was my thought, just in terms of how to save all of this. So I love scanning documents and reducing the amount of paper. <laughs> For me, though, that creates a problem. I'm real good at scanning, get rid of a lot of paper that I don't need. I feel good about myself. I save it. And then, you know, four years later when I need it, I have absolutely no clue where it is. Is it on this hard drive, that hard drive, this laptop, an external drive? Did I put it in iCloud? Did I put it in Dropbox? Is it on, on Google Drive? And there's just stuff that goes missing. Well, that's not exactly a, uh, a good way to go about it. So what I thought was, why don't we create links in a Google Doc to, in this case, all of the documents that I'm going to scan. Many of them come to us in electronic form to begin with, but if they're paper, I'll scan them. I'll create links to all of these uh, documents, 
and I'll be able to find them easily as long as I don't lose this one Google Doc, which I shouldn't lose it. So that's sort of the general thinking. And I, it doesn't really matter where I save the, the, the files. I can save them in Dropbox and link to them very easily in a Google Doc. Of course, I can save them uh, in Google Drive, not a problem. I can save them in iCloud. Uh, and what you pick, totally up to you. You may have some other cloud service uh, that you want to use. Uh, you could, of course, do this totally off the cloud and just create a Word document and link it to files on your hard drive. That's another option. I, I tend to go the cloud route, and it makes sharing the files uh, very easy with my wife. And so that's what I've done here. So what I thought I'd do with this document as I was working through is say, what, what is it that I want to keep? What information am I going to need down the road about the new home? So uh, as you can see, for those watching the video, the first category I had was just all the documents related to the purchase of the home, right? So what does that include? Well, obviously the signed contract, and we've got a, an electronic version of it, so very easy to drop in your favorite cloud storage service and add a link uh, to it in, um, in, Google, uh, in a Google Doc. And uh, so we've got that. We're not financing the home, but if you were gonna finance it, and uh, of course we've financed previous purchases, it took us a long time to get to this point, but uh, you would, you would wanna to link to all of the relevant documents related to your mortgage, by the way. I will confess that I thought long and hard about financing, in part because interest rates are just so low. We were able to get a, could have gotten, uh, a non-conforming loan, otherwise known as a jumbo, 80% uh, loan to value, 30-year fixed, no points, 3.75%. And I, th I thought long and hard about that. Ultimately, decided against it. I mean, I don't have debt now, so <laughs> why start? But, you know, I could regret that. Five years from now, if a savings account interest rate is 5%, I might wish I had made a different decision, but eh, I doubt it. Uh, so in any event, you want to link your financing documents. We want to include an inspection report. We got it. Our purchase of our new home was contingent on an inspection report. And actually, this is a, a kind of an important thing to, th to think about when you're buying a home. Uh, what that means, when we say it's contingent, what that means is basically we can void the contract for any reason we want. I mean, an inspection report's gonna come back with something on it. We don't even have to negotiate if we don't want to. We can just say, you know what, the deal's off. Uh, and of course, there's a time limit. I think we had seven or 10 days. And in our case, the inspection report came back uh, with not too many, there were a few issues, but, but uh, not too many. And we, we were able to very quickly come to an agreement with the seller who just provided a small credit rather than trying to address them all. But I, of course, I want to keep that inspection report because once we move in, I'm going to address maybe not every item in the inspection report, but a lot of them. Uh, and so we have that in electronic uh, form. I'm going to attach it uh, to this document, save it uh, in, in Dropbox, and um, I'll have it. Now, before I move on, one, one strategy when you're buying a home is, particularly if there's a lot of competition, you want as few contingencies in your offer as possible to make your offer more attractive, right? So one option, and this is actually what the family did that bought our current home. They said, look, can we do a pre-inspection real quick? We'll have the inspector out tomorrow morning. Uh, this was before we were even opening up offers. This is, you know, right after we'd listed it. And um, the goal here will be that we can make an offer without an inspection contingency. And we said, sure, they came out. Uh, the inspector looked at the property like three, four hours. And the result of that was, hey, here's our offer. We don't have an inspection contingency, but you have to agree to fix, it was four things, three of which we were already in the process of fixing. Like, and they were, I mean, all of this was minor. Like one was a leak in a, in a bathroom faucet, which we knew about, we were gonna fix it. I mean, it was that kind of stuff. And they had one that we didn't know about, it turned out not to be an issue, but here's the key. Their, their offer wasn't contingent. It wasn't a contingency. It was, which is different, right? What it said was, if you agree to our offer, you, what you agree to do is fix these four things. So if we didn't fix them, it wouldn't make the contract voidable, but they could, in theory, sue us for damages. That's the lawyer and me kind of distinguishing. But there's a big difference between a contract provision that says you will do something and a provision that says, hey, wait a minute, no, no. This isn't just you doing something. This is a contingency. If this doesn't happen, we don't have a deal at all, 
right? Um, and so when you're thinking about buying a home, if there's a lot of competition, you might want to ask to do a, a uh, they call it a pre-inspection. And then if there's no big issues, maybe you don't list anything in the contract. Or if there's just one or two things, you list them. And it may, it may make your offer a little more appealing. But regardless, you're going to want to save the inspection report. Uh, we want to keep the, the radon tests. So both the home we're buying had a test. The home we're selling had a test. They both passed, so no issues. But I want to keep it. I mean, it's probably not the most important document. But, um, you know, if I, if I ever test the home later, it'll give me something to compare. And why not keep it? It's easy to keep. So, And then, of course, we had the, we're going to, even though we're not financing it, we're going to buy owner's title insurance, right? So think of that as if we buy this home and it turns out the sellers didn't own the property they thought they owned, which you may say, does that actually happen? Well, it does. And I actually litigated a case over what's called adverse possession. Uh, and, and it was contentious. And it was over like, I, as I recall, a two or three inch or maybe it was a foot strip of, of side yard between two homes. People get, yeah, it's, yeah, they get emotional about their property. I get it. So you definitely want owner's title insurance. And as part of that, they do a survey. They send you a, a plat as a result, you know, uh, of, of the survey. And so I've got that. And you can see, for those watching, I've already sort of linked to it. So I could click this link and go to my survey. But you're going to want to include that. Uh, and then the HUD-1 statement. So the HUD-1 statement, real important. Let me pull one up on the on the screen, if I can get a quick image of one. Many of you have probably seen these, maybe. Well, there we go. There we go. So this is a standard form, and it lays out basically everything that's due from the borrower and everything that's due from the seller, the, the, the Rows uh, and blocks are numbered, almost like a tax form. Now, uh, and this is obviously important for closing because it tells you what you need to bring in terms of money to the close. And it breaks it all out between taxes and borrowing costs, if you have them, and all the fees, any credits that the, the seller is providing, and, and, of course, the sale price. And this document is important to keep for, among other reasons, you want to give it to your tax preparer or use it when you're preparing your own taxes because some of the, pay, the, the, the things that, you, that inclu get included on this form could be tax deductible. Um, that's, that issue has gotten even muddier in recent years uh, with some of the tax changes. And, uh, but it's an important document uh, to keep and either use while you're preparing your own taxes, and I'm sure something like, I haven't personally done this, but... I'm sure something like a TurboTax would walk you through the, the rows that are important and have you enter the numbers and do the calculations for you. I'm assuming it does. And if you use someone to prepare your taxes, they will want it. And that actually, before we go to the, to the next item, kind of brings up another use for the system that I'm describing and something, something I'm going to do. And it's this. Every year, I just swear I'm going to do better the next year with organizing my tax documents. Because, you know, come January, um, you know, I think I'm organized, but it always takes me hours upon hours to, it's like, I feel like I do more work collecting everything than my tax accountant does in preparing the tax returns. And Vince, if you're listening, that may not be true, but it feels that way. Um, by the way, I'm sure Vince is not listening. In any event, I'm going to do the same thing for our taxes each year that I'm doing for our home. So if we go back to the Google Doc, I'm going to have a similar doc just like this that's taxes, 2019. And every document that I need, that I'm gonna end up giving to my accountant, I'm gonna list the same way, and, uh, and then just give them access to the Google Doc. Done, done and done. And one of the things that'll allow me to do, take for example, charitable contributions. We tend to give a fair amount to charity. Now the, the, the big gifts, uh, of course that's relative, but for us, the big items are easy to track. Uh, in our case, we give them through the Vanguard Charitable uh, trust or donor advised uh, trust. So uh, that's usually just one transaction a year. It's one document. It's easy. But we give small amounts to uh, our church and small amounts to um, uh, other organizations. We, we donate clothes and things like that. And so over time, we can sort of generate these receipts, you know, uh, and what I've done in the past is just scanned them and stuck them in a folder. 
But then what I have to do is either give them all to my accountant and pay him to do all the work to add everything up and make sure everything's right, or do it myself. And so what I can do now is have a section of my tax document that says charitable contributions. And each time we, we give clothing or whatever it is, you've got the estimate of the value, you scan the receipt, you put it in, and you put the amount. And then at the end of the year, it's easy to total it up. So the, the approach I'm taking with our new home, I'm also going to take with our tax returns. You know, the same thing will be when we pay real estate taxes. Or if we, we haven't this year, we won't need to. But in past years, we've always paid estimated taxes. And this may sound pathetic, but at the end of the year, I'm always like, wait a minute, when did I pay estimated taxes? And I'm going back to the checkbook, trying to find everything, worried that I'm going to miss some big tax payment I made. Well, that's silly. And right now I can just, I, you know, if we, if we get to the point where we're making estimated pa- tax payments again, won't be this year, but I can just record them in this Google Doc with uh, uh, the date and the check number. And I, I can, if I want, link a scan of the check. So very easy to do. And I can uh, link... Uh, the receipt, which comes via email when I pay our real estate taxes. So very simple to do. All right. So that's the HUD-1 statement. Very important. We had a termite inspection report. I'll link to that. And in our case, the new home has a pool. And so we had an inspection of the pool. And that inspection had a lot of important information. I mean, uh, we, I, well, my wife had a pool growing up. I have a lot to learn when it comes to taking care of a pool. And so I want to link to that inspection report. So That first section, I've gone through a number of documents. There could be others, certainly, uh, that are important to you, uh, depending on the transaction. But here, I just want to, the goal here is to collect all of the documents related to the purchase of a a home uh, that are important that you want to keep. And once you do, it's so easy to find, right? And so that's the first section. Now, the second section is insurance. And, uh, you know, some of this I could... I could probably do without, right? Because for me, I could log into Nationwide where we have our insurance and pull up any policy I want. And I email Kelly, our insurance agent, eh, not too often, but a couple times a quarter probably or once a quarter. So, you know, it's not like I don't know who my insurance agent is, but it seems to me that um, there's a couple of benefits to, to recording the information here. So if I record my insurance agent's name and in my case, her contact information, including email, it's there, but, but it's also there for my wife, who almost never communicates. I don't th- know that she's ever communicated with our insurance agent. She wouldn't know wh- who she is, probably. Uh, well, now she'll know. It's, in, it's kind of like the blue binder, which I've talked about in the past. Now she'll know who the insurance agent is. And then I can link to our homeowner's policy. In our case, I'll link to an umbrella policy. And we had flood insurance on our current home, uh, didn't have to have it. We weren't required to, but there is a flood easement on part of our property. And I'm just, you know, cautious by nature with that sort of thing. We actually have an earthquake rider uh, on our policy. There was an earthquake here in Virginia in 2000, I think 11. Um, So anyway, whatever insurance policies you have, you can link them here. Of course, you know, you have to update it because the policies change usually every six months or 12 months. Uh, So a little bit of work uh, to maintain this accurately, but it'll all be in one place. All right. Now, the next section in my document is for contractors. This is really important. Uh, Over the years, we've done a lot of work to our current home. Some of it's been big. Some of it's been small. A lot of it uh, would be relevant for tax purposes. So as you may know, if you're using your home as your primary residence, uh, you can exclude a certain amount of the gain from a, an eventual sale from t- from taxes. What is it? Two fifty for a single filer, five hundred for married. Uh, and so what you do is you you end up taking whatever you sell the home for minus certain fees that you pay to sell it, and you subtract your 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 basis. That's the technical term that they use. Well, most people think of that as well whatever you paid for the home, but that's actually not correct. It's not just what you paid for the home. You can add to that number. For example, let's say you renovated the home and added an addition. You could add the cost of that addition to your, 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 your purchase price, and it would increase your basis, right? Uh, and so for that reason, and there's others, but that's one big reason where I want to keep a list of all the work that's done on the house. And we dealt with that with our current home and selling it. We were pretty good, but, you know, there were times like, wait, when did we get the kitchen redone? 
And didn't we do this? Oh, we forgot about that. Well, we had a whole house generator put in. We forgot about that. So rather than guessing, uh, I'm going to keep a list of all, really all of the work we have done on our house, big and small, even if uh, I, it's the kind of work that may not increase the tax basis of the home. Now, what you see for those watching the video is just a simple table that I dropped into the Word document. I actually don't think this is the best, best approach. I'm going to show you a different ap approach in a minute. Uh, but you can see the, the, the name of the contractor, their contact information, the, the work they did, and, and the last work. If you know, Sometimes we have contractors that come multiple times. Uh, really, you need more information than this, right? I'm going to want to link to the proposal, um, the receipt for the payment, uh, and, of course, I'm going to want to know the cost, right, what we paid for the work. So this is sort of just uh, a, a bare-bones example but uh, you're going to really want more information than that. Now, the idea of this table, though, isn't really to record all of that. It's just to give me sort of name and contact and the work that they did. My thinking for now is what I'll do is, under Renovations and Improvements, which is a separate section of this document, I'll actually list the work that's done. Uh, and so what I've done here is just given some examples uh, and the first one is a window replacement. On the new home, there are two windows that are broken. So we'll, we'll, we'll pay to have them replaced when, when we move it into the new home. I also know that we're going to want to add more insulation to the attic. Where we live in northern Virginia, we're right on the border between what the government says you should have R38 versus R50. I'll probably put in R50. Uh, right now, it's maybe R10. I mean, it really needs a lot more insulation. And those are just two of the things that we're going to do to the home. I want to record that information. Now, uh, one thing, if you look, for those, again, watching the video, you'll see that to the left where I'm pointing now, uh, Google Docs creates an outline uh, of your document, which is really handy. It'll be a, a nice way to quickly find information, particularly as the years go by and what starts out as maybe a two or three or four page document is now 20 pages long. You'll notice that it's got a section for renovations and improvements, and then indented is the first improvement, window replacements. But you'll notice there's no entry for insulation uh, in the outline. Why is that? Well, I did that on purpose so I could show you how this works. You'll notice that renovation and improvements, if we highlight it and come up here, it's, it's been styled as heading two. And that makes the text a little bigger and adds it to the outline. Window replacements has been styled as heading three, and that's why in the outline it's indented. If we do the same thing with insulation and style it as heading three, it gets added to the outline, indented again under renovations and improvements. Uh, that's really handy. Again, imagine as the years go by and you've had 10 or 15 or 20 different things done to your home, and it makes it just easier to find. So that's what that is. And again, with each of these, uh, you can see a, a place to link the receipt, which I'll do. You could create a table for all of this, and I'll show you that in a minute, even beyond uh, the, this limited table for contractors if you wanted to. But I kind of like this approach um, because it, just, it, it gives me an opportunity to add some context. What you see there is very limited. Uh, for example, those just listening to the audio under window replacements, it just says, we replaced one master bedroom window and one window in the third bedroom on such and such a date. Anderson Windows performed the work at a cost of blank. By the way, I have no idea if we use Anderson Windows, but I just threw that in there. Uh, and I actually don't know if I've spelled Anderson Windows correctly. We've got to look that up. Is it E-N or O-N? It's E-N. Hmm. Got to change that. Anyway, this allows me to add more detail. I mean, but I can put the name of the, the point of contact, um, any issues that came up during install, ins when they installed the new windows, whatever. So I kind of like this narrative form, but you can do it however you like. And okay, so that's that. Now we get to paint. Paint is a problem for us. We, you know, it seems like a simple thing. Each time you paint something or have someone paint something, you keep a record of the, the you know, was it Benjamin Moore, Sherwin, whatever the paint was, Home Depot, whatever you got and uh, the name of the color, and of course every color has a unique number, uh, doesn't seem that difficult. But somehow I managed to mess it up and not keep this information all the time. So I've, I've, I've committed to not doing that with the new home, and I'm going to get an opportunity because there are definitely homes, uh, rooms in the new home we're going to paint 
what we found is that realtors, for some reason, want to go into a home before they sell it and paint everything gray. That's the new color, gray. Uh, that kind of, some grays are okay, but it's kind of depressing. So we'll definitely do some painting. And so what I started to do, as you'll see uh, if you watch the video, is I've got a table embedded into the, uh, the Google Doc. And the information I've got is the date the work was done, who did the work, uh, what room in the home they painted, uh, the paint brand, the color name, the color number. Very simple. The reality, though, is that Google Docs is not the gr greatest place for a table. So what you can do is create the same kind of information in a Google Sheet, right, in a, in a spreadsheet, and then just link the spreadsheet from the Google Doc, and that's what you see for those watching the video here, and I've created a link, and I can go to that link, and it opens up a Google Spreadsheet with, at, at the moment, the exact same columns. Obviously, I can add to those uh, uh, columns, and, and really, it probably makes keeping this kind of information a little easier, and that's um, probably the approach that I'll take. Again, your approach, totally up to you. I think they both will work. You can make both work, um, but this is the approach we're going to take uh, for paint, and the, the big issue for us is just keeping track so we know the color that we used in every room and who did the work. Now, uh, the next section for us is the pool. At the moment, again, we've just got a pool inspection report, but there's going to be a lot of things I'm going to want to track uh, about the pool, including costs associated with maintaining it. Right now, it's a chlorine pool. That's the big question. Do we convert it to salt water? By the way, if you've got an opinion on that, uh, keep it to yourself. No, I'm just kidding. I'd love to hear what your opinion is, because I, my current inclination is to convert it to salt water. But uh, when I talk to people, they have very strong opinions about this issue, and it's either one or the other. But overall, I would say most people I talk to say salt water is the way to go. So if, if you can shed any light on that for me, dr at doroller.net. So pool, that, we're going to end up having a lot of information under the pool uh, category. Now, there are a couple of things uh, that I haven't included here that I will eventually add. And of course, you can add whatever is useful for your home. Uh, for us, it's going to be things that we're going to have installed later, like we're going to install a security system. Now, that could just go under renovations and improvements, uh, or I could create a separate category for it. Depends how big it gets, but we're going to install security cameras, a security system. Uh, we're going to install uh, sort of a home automation system. Uh, and we're not going to get crazy about it, you know. But um, you know, I like to be able to control some things from an iPhone or an iPad. Um, things like the garage doors and lighting and that sort of thing. Um, and it's not really too expensive if you if you do it right, and some of it you can do yourself. And uh, so I'll have uh, a section on that. You could also have a section, I think it could actually be useful to have a section about your local representatives. I mean, uh, I, I confess, I couldn't name my Virginia representative and senator. Not, not, not at the federal level, I can name those. But at the state level, I'm embarrassed to say I can't do it. That's pathetic. I could put that in this document. Um, I could put information uh, relevant to where we're living and things, you know, information about the area that could come in uh, useful, uh, come in handy uh, down the road. I mean, really, you can put anything in here that's useful to you and that makes organizing the information and the data uh, helpful. And uh, so that's what I'm doing with our new home. Uh, what you see here is just a generic uh, example. Again, I will leave a link to this in the Facebook group and hopefully you find it helpful and you can um, maybe use it for yourself. Again, I think it's an excellent approach for taxes and so I'm creating a similar document for our taxes. You could use it to keep track of other large assets like your, your, your cars, for example, and have information about the purchase of the car, all of your service records if you wanted to, um, uh, and, and things of that nature. So uh, financing of a car, um, you know, you could use a similar approach for your student loans. I mean, it's ridiculous how many student loans one person can have. And it's incredibly, sometimes, depends on your situation, challenging just to keep track of everything. And uh, this could help you do it. So uh, you could really use this approach for a lot of your finances and organizing things. So hopefully you find it helpful. I'm kind of excited about it. I think this will be a great way to keep track of all of um, our, our home-related stuff, whether it relates to taxes and just keeping a list of contractors and people that we trust that we've used in the past 
that have been helpful to us and, and, and done good work at a fair price. And so some of it's just practical, but I think it'll be very, very useful. If you think there are things that could be added to this, maybe that I didn't touch on at all, and I'm sure there's plenty, uh, let me know, uh, drdorler.net. I'll mention it in a future show, or just drop by the Facebook group, dorler.net slash Facebook group, and uh, leave a comment there. Now, for those of you that have made it this far, I want to give you a quick update about my book, Retire Before Mom and Dad. I've chosen a cover. I showed that in the last episode. So if you watched the video, you saw the cover, and um, hope you like it. I'm excited about it. I am now doing what's called a line edit, which is where I read the whole thing and basically correct typos. And there's two rounds of that. So it's slated to go on pre-sale in August. I'll let you know as we get closer. And then it'll be launched in September, probably the end of September. I'll let you know as we get closer. And if you want to get updates via email, you can just go to retirebeforemomanddad.com and sign up for the newsletter. Uh, and I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm reading it and um, uh, I love the book. I hope you guys love it. I think it, it looks at personal finance and saving and investing in a fresh and new way. And I think we need that. Uh, and so anyway, I'm really looking forward to this thing getting finally done. I know uh, many of you have patiently waited for longer than I care to admit, and I'm grateful for that patience. So that's the deal. That's the, the update. It's, we're getting closer. And I'm excited about it. Hey, hope you have a great day and a great week. Until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.